The issue here, uh, and I want to thank David for inviting me, uh, and I also want to thank uh, especially my students from uh, Warwick University who are here. Uh, this is, a, this is a, I think, a very important kind of issue, and very often you don't have much social science input into it. Um, and this is why I titled the talk the way I did, which focuses on the issue of social justice. Um, it was mentioned that uh, I've uh, authored this book on uh, Humanity 2.0. Um, actually, now there's been sort of three books related to this topic. Um, but in this first book, Humanity 2.0, I immediately raised the question of social justice in a very particular way. I don't actually want to spend most of the talk talking about this, but I do think it's worth sort of putting on the table now. Um, and that is, um, you might say, uh, the problem that's always affected uh, all sorts of innovations in the history of human society, uh, and that is, uh, uneven development, right? Uh, and, and, and so, and, and in this case, uh, there's a lot of potential for uneven development to occur even more massively than it has had in the past. Um, and so in terms of a kind of benchmark that one might look at to make sure that not 90% of the population is left behind in all these innovations that we're talking about, um, I mean, the way I think about it uh, in terms of the way I, I first started writing about this was in terms of what would count as uh, adequate, decent health provision for an entire society given the existence of a national health service. It seems to me that's kind of the way the mind should be focused on this. Um, and interestingly, when, I've ta when I teach this topic to students, you know, so this broad range of topics of where humanity is going with regard to all of these biomedical and technological changes, the humanity 2.0 stuff, transhumanism, uh, which hasn't really been mentioned as a word, but it's sort of the ideology that covers over all this. Um, one of the things that uh, I often have students look at uh, is uh, a policy document that was put out by Demos, the new labor think tank, uh, back in 2006 called Better Humans. Better Humans. Uh, and you can still download this from the Demos website. Uh, and there, you actually see, as it were, in policy-sized, bite-sized chunks, you know, that even the ADD politician can understand what is kind of at stake in terms of all the new innovations that are on the table. Because whatever one wants to say about new labor, they were actually kind of on this tip 10 years ago. Okay? Um, and everything sort of got messed up and lost, and God knows what the new labor party is going to do now. Um, but, but the point is that, that this isn't a way the, the one's mind ought to be focused about this initially, and, and the National Health Service is a good place. What will count as the new normal, right? That, that's sort of the, the standard that you want to bring everyone to. And I think one of the, you know, the main problem that of course gets put on the table is at the moment uh, you basically have people, uh, you have two kinds of people, both of whom to varying degrees are outlaws, given current laws. Uh, one are the people who privately experiment with, you know, various kinds of drugs and things like this under the radar as it were, which may or may not work. And that's the other thing, we have a lot of urban legends about this, but not a lot of very verifiable data about what's actually doing what to whom, okay? Uh, and on the other hand, of course, you've got rich people. And they can do whatever they want, and they can offshore it, and you may know something about the seasteading initiative that Peter Thiel started. Uh, a couple of years ago with Google and all of this, where you basically have a boat that's parked outside of the territorial limits of the United States, and it's able to do all the kinds of experiments that you can't do within the territory of the United States because of institutional review boards of ethics. This may or may not actually happen, but they're all, you know, they've got it scoped out, let's put it that way. Um, but the point is, in a sense, these are, as it were, the pioneers. These are the people who, as it were, are taking the risks. These are the ones uh, who are, in fact, you know, leading the wave toward, you know, in some sense, making this kind of stuff that we're talking about more generally available. The problem is mo much of it at the moment is kind of under the radar, often criminalized, and as a result, it's very, clear, it's very hard to actually get a very strong uh, publicly available sense of what is working and what is not working, and as a result, it is very difficult to get the kind of feedback that one needs, especially from the mistakes and the errors that are necessary for making further progress. Right? People make lots of claims. Right? But the, the fact is, if half of what you're doing is illegal, it's going to be very unlikely you're going to show the evidence for it. Okay? And so as long as we live in a world like this, it's actually going to be very difficult to know where progress is heading. 
Okay, so um, last year, uh, Veronica Lipinska and I uh, published a book called The Proactionary Imperative, right, which is basically uh, saying that the first thing that we need to do when we're thinking about how do we construct a society, a society that we wish to be just, right, in a sense roughly like justice in the way we understand it now, so with a welfare state, where one is concerned about that everyone has a kind of decent standard of living, at least at a minimum level, you know, so take all of that as kind of given. How do we have to construct society in order for the kinds of innovations that we're talking about, ones that can lead to increasing uneven development, to be able to, as it were, see the light of day, to be examined, to be criticized, and also to be improved as a result of showing what the actual results are when real life people do them. Okay, um, and, and so this means, in the first instance, and this is why uh, we use the word proactionary, it involves a much more kind of open-minded and positive attitude toward risk. And I think this is kind of what the, you know, in a sense, in terms of the kind of culture in which we live, which makes it in a way kind of difficult, for a lot of this kind of broadly transhumanist stuff to be accepted, right, is that we, uh, in fact, live in a culture that is risk averse, generally speaking, and in a sense, part of the criminalization of all of this kind of risky behavior is, as it were, taken in a paternalistic way on behalf of those who might hurt themselves, okay? Um, and those of you who are familiar with the way these discussions take place uh, in the environmental movement, we'll know about the precautionary principle. And this was, of course, uh, also invoked with regard to restricting the development of genetically modified organisms in this part of the world, in, the, in Europe, and it is actually written into a lot of policy legislation at the European Union level. And it seems to me that as long as we start with a default position, that is precautionary with regard to risk, it is actually going to be very difficult to do all of the kind of testing which has to be done publicly. Because look, at the end of the day, most of what we're talking about is stuff that is going to transform the lives of individual people who at the moment are living quite different sorts of lives. So no matter how much research you do under controlled laboratory conditions, right, where you have your populations all scoped out. You can get a lot of information that way. There's no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, you have to see what, it is, what the world is like when people actually live with this stuff in them. And you need to be able to gather the data that comes from that. And that has to be done in a decriminalized way. Now, there is another side to this, of course, and this is something that we talk about in this book, is that we actually need a culture that is willing to recognize that there are going to be a lot of mistakes, there are going to be a lot of errors, and there are going to be a lot of harms. We are going to try to anticipate them, and this is where, you know, issues of foresight and so forth are very important to see down the road what is likely to happen, what are likely to be the unintended consequences of what we're doing. Because just because something is unintended doesn't mean it can't be anticipated. Right? Unintended has to do with whether you meant it from a moral standpoint. It doesn't necessarily imply anything from a cognitive standpoint about whether you know it's going to happen. Okay? This is something military people will tell you about all the time. It's called collateral damage. Right? I mean, and in a sense, this is kind of the mentality one needs to operate under if we're going to organize society in a way that we're actually going to be able to encourage people to take the requisite risks that will be required to enable all these innovations actually to be of general social benefit. It will actually encourage more people to actually buy into this, okay? So it doesn't just look like an elite conspiracy against the rest of the population, which is kind of how it looks like now, to be perfectly honest. Okay, so, so there is this issue. So whenever you, know, you think about the specific proposal that I'm making at this point, I do think that the general point uh, is that there has to be a way of enfranchising everyone to be part of this project that we are talking about here. Okay? Um, and you just can't, and, and it is, and the nature of the project is such that we actually don't know what the right answers are in advance. We actually don't know what's going to work. We're actually going to have to try out a lot of things, many of which will not work. And nevertheless, we have to keep people on board. Right? And this is where we're talking about having a proactionary culture that's open to risk. 
Because if you look at the history of science and technology that's made the world the way it is today, you know, both positively and negatively, it came from a world where people were willing to take a lot more risks than people are willing to take today. Okay? And I do think that, this, so that, and, and then, the, so, so the point is, how do you sell risk? Right? Let's put it as a kind of bottom line basic issue. Okay? So that's the kind of, and, and I do think at the end of the day, you have to, you have to kind of make it worthwhile for individuals to participate in it. Because look, we live in a culture that's actually very prone to self-experimentation. I actually think people have given half a chance will take all kinds of, kinds of risks with their lives. Right? The problem is they're worried that they'll get caught for it. And being caught means you get put in jail rather than actually looking at your data to see what we can learn from it. Okay? Uh, and I do think that this is kind of, we have to, so we need to shift the mentality on this to get everybody to buy into this. So how much more time do I have? Uh, you, have I, you have 10 minutes. You 10 minutes, okay. okay. 10 minutes. Um, okay, so that's kind of what the, the way in which I kind of normally come into this topic. Um, and uh, now I want to talk about a couple of other things that's also involved with the social justice issue. Um, and, and this has to do, in the first instance, with um, an issue that came up the, this morning, and I think it's very much in the in the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, and it's uh, and it's you know since since I do have some of my sociology students here, I'll invoke the name of Karl Marx. Um, and and it's the way one interprets what's the lesson of Marx for our time. And I sort of disagree with the way in which Marx tends to be trotted out in this context. Okay, um, because I do think there's a kind of more interesting, subtler kind of issue here. Um, I think the normal way in which we talk about, you know, what is Marx's relevance for the kind of world we live in, especially for thinking about social justice, uh, largely revolves around the issue of uh, the consequences of technological unemployment. In other words, we sort of see um, the, the kinds of developments, you know, with sort of androids, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, the way in which machines in that enhanced sense uh, is replacing human labor, you know, more than it has done over the previous two centuries. In a way, it's kind of like a continuation of capitalism 1.0, right? And so, uh, you know, so the, so the big nightmare is there won't even be human beings, you won't even need human beings any longer to exploit for surplus value because you'll have the machines who don't even need to pull down a wage. And I do think that a lot of this rather curious, to my mind, talk that we've heard this morning, for example, and, and Zoltan Istvan, the US presidential candidate for Transhumanist Party, puts right on the agenda, the basic national income, right? Now, it seems to me that kind of idea comes from having the Marxist scenario in the back of your mind, right? The people will no longer need to work, so how are they gonna live, right? Uh, and so, it, you know, and, and uh, it's a very strange kind of notion from a Marxist standpoint, right? Namely, that we're just paying you to live insofar as Marx believed that the meaning of life came from working. Okay, so in a sense you're sort of shifting, <laughs> you're sort of shifting the, 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 the mentality. However, capitalism is very resourceful. So we don't actually have to, th we don't have to stick with capitalism 1.0, which is kind of what Marx was working from, but we can transform Marx's concepts into this new world, which I think we are developing with the introduction with, of all these intelligent machines and so forth. And th this would be the capitalism 2.0. And capitalism 2.0 has no problem extracting surplus value from human beings because it happens every time you're in front of a computer screen and you click a mouse for a choice. Okay, we live in a world, of course, as you know already, even before this kind of capitalism 2.0, whatever dystopia that I'm presenting, we already live in a world where people are quite used to blurring the distinction between work and leisure, right? Because it's all happening in front of a computer screen. Okay, and of course we also know that all of this data is being collected, you know, it's being used for marketing purposes, for, for government surveillance purposes, whatever. Um, and the next step along the way would be to pay people for it, right? Uh, in other words, you pay people for this information that they are sort of giving up. This is, in a way, this becomes the new coin of labor in capitalism 2.0. It is all of the typing on the keyboard, the clicking of the mice, right? All of the data streams that it, it emanate from it, and you will be paid for this. And this is how you will make your living, and, you, and then you will spend that 
that money you use on buying the goods that those very same people will be selling you. Okay? And they will shift things around and so forth. And, and it, so in other, in other words, the locus of exploitation will shift from the factory, which will be completely automated, etc., etc., and will move into the home, strictly speaking. But the home will be a kind of hybrid space. It won't be a home versus factory thing. It'll be home as factory. Right? We will all be our little cottage industries being exploited by the people who actually understand uh, how to use the data for purposes of generating more capital. Okay? It seems to me that's the social justice issue down the road here. Okay? And so within sociology, um, we do have a notion called the prosumer, which is a kind of hybrid of producer and consumer. Um, and the idea here is that people take back, right? So there's a sense in which when you're generating data to Google, that Google is able to mine, Google can do a lot more with your data than you can, actually. Okay? What can you do? You might be able to buy some good in Amazon at a discount price, but Google can mix it up with all other kinds of data streams and then come up with all kinds of nifty, nifty programs which then shape your behavior in a certain way. So there's a certain kind of power asymmetry that's built into this interaction at the moment. And that power asymmetry is bound to increase unless there's some active measure by government, by grassroots. At this point, you know, one doesn't care, um, but to, as it were, redress the issue. Okay? Um, this, by the way, I think, by itself, this potential problem down the road is an argument for people to have relatively advanced levels of computer literacy in society. So they can understand exactly how the data that they are generating spontaneously, which will be the source of the wealth that they produce in society in the future, is actually being used. Right? And to, in some way, take back that power asymmetry, you know, be it by getting into businesses where effectively they're selling their own data or they're cooperating with others. I mean, the political economy that could arise from this is, of course, a quite an open question. And once again, you're going to need government and regulatory agencies to keep their eye on the ball to see how this is developing. But insofar as we want to talk about the issue of social justice as basically the elimination of exploitation, this, this is the next site of exploitation. It is the exploitation that happens whenever you, quote, voluntarily click something in front of a computer screen. You will not need to leave your home. You will not need to go to an office somewhere else, or a factory, or whatever. Okay? This will be the issue, and we need to start thinking about that issue now, because I think that is something that is going to enwrap everyone. Okay? I'm going to uh, stop speaking here in the interest of time. Uh, the one thing, though, that I have not touched on, but I hope someone brings up in the question, uh, a question and answer period, is equality. What does equality mean in this kind of new capitalism 2.0 world that we might be talking about? And I'll thank you here. So if I click on a picture of a puppy when actually I prefer kittens, is that fraud? No. It might be a mistake, but it's called a revealed preference. <laughs> How come is that social injustice comparable to the other kinds of 1.0 social injustice when people can't get access to health care or they can't get access to good education? Uh, this seems to be a rather uh, cosmetic and almost flippant example of social injustice. Not at Well, first of all, I do think that, I mean, there are a couple of issues going on here. First of all, I do think that the kind of minimum stuff that in the past that we would have called problems of social injustice are gradually being <coughs> taken care of, but it's complicated by the fact that actually as people find out about what is out there and the more things that are available. Not every, we don't have as coherent a notion or as cohesive a notion of what it is to live a just existence uh, as we have had in the past. You know, so for example, I mean, so I think it's very wise, for example, so, so if you want to say, is there such a thing as a decent, decent lifestyle for people, okay? I think you find many more people today than let's say when you and I were kids believing that this notion has a kind of paternalistic sound to it, right? In other words, people actually think, look, there are a lot of ways one can be behave. Some people will want to invest a lot of money in healthcare and would love the government to invest in healthcare. Other people would say, I'll take my chances, and I want the money to do what I want with it. 
Okay? And, and as people find out more about the way the world works, thanks to the internet and the rest of it, people are, there, there is no longer this kind of common notion of what the, the, the standard level of justice is. We're more, uh, I think, to a certain extent rightly, uh, relying, on, relying on people to be competent, autonomous individuals, and we also expect that people will make mistakes, and that not every mistake can be bailed out equally. You see, I think we, so, so in other words, we can't assume that, 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 that the social democratic horizons of, of when I was a kid, when you were a kid, I don't think we can presume that as the default position anymore. There may be something desirable about getting back to that default position, but it'll have to be in this new world that we're coming into. It can't be just by reminding us what Marx said in the 19th century, but we'll have to be in a world of this capitalism 2.0. We can't go back to the past. That would be my point here. And you always have to take seriously what the default positions are at the moment. I mean, the fact that the Tories won an absolute majority in the last election should wake people up on this point if they still think that in some sense there is a classical social democratic model as the default position of, of Western societies. It has shifted. For better or worse, it has shifted. And we need to, in some sense, regain, recover what is still a value of social democracy in the welfare state. I'll stop there. <laughs> I would very much offer you the opportunity to talk about equality because I loved your concept of the prosumer and us as being data producers as well as data consumers but also data analysts and above all data interpreters. Would you think that the equality could arise if indeed all of us as data producers also became excellent data analysts and interpreters of financial data and financial yes. so-called economic data? I agree 100%. And in fact, I do, you know, if um, one of the things that uh, I have my students do, because I teach a, a first year course called The Life of Media, uh, is to actually design a kind of media literacy course for the 21st century. And so one of the things that is very important is to be able to understand this kind of stuff, of financial data, especially in the way they intertwine with other kinds of data, and to become much more sophisticated about this. Um, I agree with you 100%, okay? So, so there, there, there is no question here. Um, the issue about equality, um, I think here, one, um, in a way this would open up a whole new different set of issues. But I just want, I would just draw attention to a distinction that's typically made in political theory with regard to issues of equality. And the first one is the equality of opportunity, and the other is the equality of outcomes. Okay, equality of outcomes is a kind of socialist idea typically, right? Equality of opportunity is a much more liberal idea, okay? Um, and, and they do have different, somewhat different dynamics to them, okay? Um, but I think the thing that they have in common and this is the thing that could actually be lost. It's a kind of meta level, second order level consideration. Is that both notions of equality presume we all live in the same society. And as we heard, I believe it was from, uh, from Callum, uh, yes, uh, the, um, this idea, there is this kind of transhumanist version of utopia where in fact what happens is uh, we no longer have to think of ourselves as living in a common society because it's only in that context really where issues of equality matter at all, but rather we can just go off into our different societies. We can subspeciate, right? We can self-segregate, right? So instead of, you know, so, it's, so in other words, you have voluntary racism, right? Instead of having some the central authority, you know, split you apart in apartheid, for example, what you now do is say, hey, that's a cool idea. I'm gonna live on my own planet. I'm gonna live in my own country. You know, uh, and, I, and, 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 there, and, and see, when you start thinking that way, that all like-minded people should just get together and move to a certain place and do their thing, then as it were, um, the issues that made equality such a luminous notion in modern political theory disappear because you no longer have to deal with difference, right? Because the problem of equality arises because of the issue of difference, whether it be cultural difference, racial difference, income difference, gender difference, whatever. But if you can self-segregate, the problem goes away. What about the people who are in the, a more unfortunate situation of uh, being born in a impoverished part of society in which they can't easily get education they wish for? They may indeed choose to self-segregate, but they may also uh, possibly want to migrate. I mean, they might want to leave yes. their war-torn parts of uh, the world and come here. So my, my question to you on inequality is this. 
So that's just a question of inequality. But do you buy into the idea that there's growing inequality? Yeah. Oh, of what? course. That the analysis of Thomas Piketty, that in some yes. ways the rich are getting richer and the, the, the people who are not in the top 10% have to struggle more and more to get in there. And this is backed up in a, a sure, technological sure. analysis of people yes. like uh, the ones we've had already, the second machine age, Andrew McCann. Yes, 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 yes. All this the is The winner true. takes all. Yes. Uh, in the past, many people would succeed, but nowadays, if the best uh, providers of, uh, say, tax software, they will displace all the tax accountants from before. You just need one. It's a winner takes all. And so I the ones who are left behind are uh, a growing number, and there's a risk of uh, alienation and anger. You, is that on your agenda? Yes, well, actually, uh, I actually, you know, I'm one of these guys who takes notes on the things I end up not talking about. Um, and that, well, that, that is on the notes, because I was going to bring up Piketty. I do think, of course, I mean, and for those of you, I take it most of you probably know, but Thomas Piketty published this book last year, um, which basically showed that, that, in a sense, the difference between the rich and the poor uh, globally is increasing. However, um, the, the interesting thing about the analysis from a historical standpoint was it actually did decrease when social democracy and the welfare state was relatively strong in the middle third of the 20th century. Okay, So in a sense, the welfare state did work in terms of decreasing the inequalities, but now that the welfare state is much weaker, the, the, the divisions have arisen again. And all of that is true. I have no problem with that point. I think there's an issue about the lesson one draws from it, Especially if one makes the other argument, and this is where the, the more, quote, liberal argument comes in, namely that, sure, the differences between the rich and the poor are increasing, but in fact, uh, more and more of the poor are being lifted out of poverty. So even though if they're falling behind, they're nevertheless in absolute terms doing better than they've ever had before, and more of them are. And so the question then becomes, what is the value of equality in this situation? So in other words, there aren't quite as many people who are living in these destitute circumstances that you were talking about earlier than there were, let's say, when we were kids. And I think there is a tendency, and there have actually been surveys done on this, for people to overestimate the number of people in the world who currently live in absolute poverty. However, absolute poverty is completely compatible with the issue that the difference between, you know, lower absolute poverty is compatible with the difference between the rich and the poor increasing. You can have both, okay? Uh, and, and, and the question then becomes, what do we make of that fact? Okay? Uh, in other words, what is the value of equality? See, the value of equality, I would argue, uh, is not to do with the amount of money you have, or even the lifestyle that you lead, but rather it has to do with the cohesiveness of society. Right? That everybody feels they have an equal stake in the society going on as a coherent thing. I mean, if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, when these kinds of measures really start to get very popular, right, the idea was to think about the world as one global community, right? And the United Nations, of course, being the potential executor of this, was very much promoting this kind of idea. And that's where the reduction of equality becomes important, where people have, they, they aren't so different in the way they lead their lives that they no longer feel they need to relate to each other in any way. And that is where I think the value of equality comes from. It doesn't come necessarily from the material conditions or anything like that, but it comes from the idea of social coherence. And insofar as we want all of humanity, in some sense, to be on the same page, that we are moving together as a species, or however you want to characterize it, then the reduction of inequality matters. But that's the main reason why it matters, not the economic reasons. Hi, Steve. Um, I would fundamentally disagree that uh, the society is moving towards inequality, um, and that's principally on based on the argument that um, everyone is ultimately a consumer, but also ultimately a producer of information. And um, the reason why we're talking about inequality is because these days we feel like the information we produce has been used by a corporation against us. It's because Someone else takes our data, what we click on the computer, but it could be also our medical information and so on. Um, you know, generating maybe drugs, maybe software on the back of that, and then selling it back to us, even though we actively contributed to the creation of this data and essentially to this product. Right, that's explo exploitation. Um, yes, having said that, if we, as a society, cultivate this um, active, um, consumer and producer status, and we reclaim 
um, this information that we pass to corporations, we essentially reduce inequality because we will no longer be on the defensive. Yes. So for example, um, there's been a lot of medical cases where people went to the hospital, their genome has been sourced on the back of their genetic testing, there's been drugs produced, and then they managed to reclaim part of the yeah. profits from that medical corporations because their genome actively, um, actively contributed to, to the creation of the drug. So I think this is how we as a society can reclaim quality and make it more equal because at the end of the day, corporations that are exploiting us can't do it because we, at the end of the day, have to buy the product. Uh, this is a very good point. This is Veronica Lipinska who's reminding uh, me of our the fourth chapter of our book, The Proactionary Imperative, where this issue is kind of argued out. So it is not just entirely social. There is an economic dimension to it. And this was the reason, by the way, why I you know, introduced this idea of the prosumer, right? Uh, namely, the idea of redressing the asymmetry between those who produce the data and those who are able to use it. Um, and uh, yes, that is an economic issue. And in a sense, it will be resolved in economic terms. But I think at the end of the day, the motivation in the general population for wanting to push toward equality, beyond, beyond just that particular power asymmetry that exists between the producers and consumers of data, will have to do with the degree of social cohesiveness that we want uh, as a species in the future. In other words, will, will, you know, one of the things that's really quite remarkable about the modern era, despite all of its hypocrisies about, you know, saying we're all human beings and we're all equal and all this kind of stuff, was that that value actually carried weight and was actually used as a standard against which you could shame people who did not live up to that standard. And what I worry about, I guess, is that if, you know, if in some sense, um, we don't get clear about why equality is important, we're going to actually lose this kind of fundamental notion of what a common humanity means. Question there? Yes, I'm going to follow that up a little bit. Because it's, I, I'm interested in um, Bill McKibben's suggestion that with genetic modification, you end up with people who don't simply fail to recognize people um, or the, the difference between people is one not of degree any longer, but of type. Right. And I was wondering if you feel that's true. And also, I was just going to ask, in a kind of general sense, is there a, I mean, particularly with transhumanism as a kind of theory that's driving a lot, I mean, in, beneath the surface of this innovation, whether the teleology beneath that is essentially kind of divisive? Uh, if that's a fair way. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, my own view, this is the way, and, and, and look, let's put it this way. I would not have gotten interested in transhumanism if I didn't think it was a kind of hum humanism 2.0. Okay, so in other words, I am committed to an idea of a universal humanity, but the problem is that we're now under ra rather radically changed circumstances, and moreover, looking at it historically, it has been the science and technology, the thing that transhumanism really says is going to deliver us in the future. The science and technology was actually the stuff that made us human in the first place. Okay? And so the point here is I see it as continuing. The way I've described it in certain places is ultra-modernism. Right? That, that transhumanism is kind of ultra-modernist. It's not postmodern. It's not anti-modern. It's ultra-modern. In a sense, it's taking the promises of humanism and kind of, you know, jacking them up to a higher level, but not renouncing them. And one of those is the universal humanity notion, okay? Uh, and that's why we should be concerned within the transhumanist movement about issues of social justice and equality and stuff like that. But how that's actually manifested, how that gets expressed politically, I don't think it'll be quite the same as it was during the modern era. And that's why, uh, you know, I'm, uh, that, that's why I think we need to realize where, where we are in the world today, because I don't think we can t kind of take the values of universalism for granted. I think there are a lot of people within the transhumanist movement that are perfectly happy with subspeciation of humanity, and that those differences in kind that you were talking about, fine, let's have them, right? You know, just like we have animal sanctuaries, right, where we put all, you know, the animal rights people love sanctuaries, right? You know, you take all these, these animals that used to be in, incarcerated, and then you give them these open spaces where they're untouched by human beings, right? And there they go, right? Wow, well, why can't we do that to ourselves as well? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, uh, we're in a futurist meeting talking about social justice. 
And I was a little dis bit disappointed that you haven't mentioned intergenerational. So. Oh, that's there too! <laughs> By that, I don't mean old folks and young folks. I mean the responsibility that the people have today for the future generations that have yet to be born. Perhaps you'd like to address a few words. Okay, so you're thinking about, you're trying to bring in the precautionary issue, right? That we might be using too much of the Earth's resources and stuff like that. That's kind of where you're coming from? No, I, I, I think that at the moment, policy and our actions gives absolutely no thought whatsoever to um, not our children or our okay. grandchildren, but our great great grandchildren, you know. People who are yet to be born in 100 years. See time. here, okay, let me tell you something, Guy. I mean, and, and this is a great point, and I wish we could have a whole conference on this issue about what does, what does intergenerational justice and future generations mean for transhumanists. Because look, if Aubrey de Grey gets his way, there is no future generation. There's just us forever. Seriously, there, there is no incentive to have children. Okay? The whole idea of future generations and intergenerational justice presumes people will have children, that there's a value in having children, that in some sense you need children to carry forward the values and so forth and the ideals that we are unable to perform in our own lifetime because of our own mortality. Once the mortality is off the table, who needs children? Who needs future generations? Right? And if we screw up the environment, we'll just self-repair our telomeres or something, right? I mean, I mean. So, so the point here is that transhumanists, I do think, have an incredibly big problem here with the intergenerational issue. It may, may not be what you were thinking initially, but I do, I do think is where is the motivation to have future generations? And you might ask, what is the value of having future generations? Why have children? Okay. Well, historically, I think one thing that you can say is that this is often a very important way of getting fresh ideas. People who come into the world without the memories of the past and then start anew, as it were, in a blank slate almost, you might say. And even though they end up repeating a lot of the mistakes of the past, they're starting from a different position. Okay? And, and so when you talk about radical conceptual cultural change, very often you're talking about generational change. So the ideas were there for many, you know, many decades or even centuries, but you need a new bunch of people who don't start with the memories of the past. Because this is the problem with Aubrey de Grey. He's also going to cure Alzheimer's. Right? And as soon as you do that, right, you, got all the, you're, you're, you can imagine the kind of nightmare from this standpoint that there would, we would live in a world of stasis, endless stasis. Okay? So it seems to me that the value of having future generations is put under serious question by transhumanism. Uh, and that's an issue I do think that we do need to, uh, to address very seriously. You know, the motivation for having children and bringing new people into the world. I'm just wondering like how like things like um like ultimate humans are intelligent beings. Like other intelligent beings like artificial general intelligence, how will they factor into this? Another another issue. I mean I think the the, 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 the I'll just make a brief point. And the point there is that unlike a lot of the scare sorry to say scaremongering, but unlike the existential risk community out there, um I I, I um, I actually think that this is going to be a very tricky sociological question because I think one of the simplifications that the existential risk community, these people who believe superintelligent machines might annihilate us, is uh, they assume that the computers will be on one side and we'll all be on the other. And that's a big mistake, right? Because uh, there is going to be allegiances on both sides. Okay, so let's get away from our 1950s science fiction B-movie type stuff where, you know, these machines take over all of us and we're all at, at, at once, to the same extent, victimized. That is very unlikely to happen because people, as has been pointed out by some of the earlier speakers today, right, we will be forming new hybrid forms of relationships with these machines, some of them being quite deep from an emotional level, and so when it comes time for the so-called war of the robots, whose side will they be on? Some of them will be on the side of the robots. Now that seems to me the, uh, the more profound issue. Question there, true. Sure. I think it's going to have to be the last one, unless both the question and the answer are brief. Okay. Okay. So I think the preference for equality in and of itself is sort of a Darwinian legacy. Oh, so really? Also, the preference for equality is a Darwinian absolutely, legacy? Absolutely, because if you ask people, would you like to make X amount of money and everybody else make more money, or would you like to make X amount of money and everybody else <laughs> makes less money, people prefer to be top of the heap. 
people would prefer that everybody else is uglier and they're more attractive more than they would prefer to be more absolutely attractive. So that's for inequality. That justifies yeah. inequality, not no, equality. I'm, I'm saying that this. I'm saying that this. People want. This is what people want to be equal when they're less. When they're when they're below other people. People <laughs> at the top of the heap don't care about equality. People at the bottom. Oh, of the heap care about but equality. the point is, it's a desire for inequality yeah. ultimately. That's the point, no, right? No, I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's a striving for for higher status. So people get concerned about inequality because they themselves would like to have higher status and would like to have more toys and more utility. And so if you look at people who live in you know, hunter-gatherer societies or whatever, they don't care that some people have computers. They care about who has more wives or no, who has more meat or whoever, yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing, right? And so rather than having this preference for equality, which I think that you have this premise where it's important for social cohesion, which I think that there's better ways to do social cohesion for example, connecting people's minds more directly than to have people be equal. I think that absolute utility is important. I don't think equality is important. And I think that it's the striving against the equality that causes a lot of damage and causes a lot of disutility. Gonna, and equality okay, by itself yeah. is actually not important. This is, this is actually very, this is a very important political philosophy divide about whether it's equality or, or, or utility. I would say the importance of equality has to do with different people being able to somehow identify as being part of the same thing. Okay, so, so the value, of the, so the cohesion I'm talking about comes from, as it were, common identity. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm aiming for there. Um, and, I, I, you know, and I do take your point about um, this kind of striving uh, for uh, equality when you're in a, uh, in a disadvantaged position. But here I would point out, to my mind, the, the important notion of equality at the end of the day from a substantive standpoint is kind of the equality of opportunity. In other words, I think what, what matters from a moral standpoint is less that everybody somehow ends up in the same position outcome-wise, but rather that everybody, as it were, has an equal chance to be whatever they can be. Right? And it seems to me that is the kind of, you know, that is a fundamentally liberal idea, right, uh, that in a sense the welfare state was designed, if you go back to the Fabian roots of it in this country, was actually, and that, that term equal opportunity comes from them, uh, was designed to do. And I do think we need to preserve that notion, that substantive notion of equality, equal opportunity in whatever future we go into, okay? And this other issue, you know, the business about what, you know, whether equality is a thing that matters for cohesiveness, that, yes, that's a philosophical difference, I think, that we'll need to put to another time. Indeed. Or, indeed, over coffee, in fact. Well, thank you very much once again, Steve Fuller.